Hello, everybody. Can you see my screen now? Yes. Okay. Yes, I'm going. So, I thank you all for being here today, and especially Laura for being with us. It's a great pleasure, and we have tried in other opportunities, but it was not possible. And for me, it's a great pleasure to meet Laura again. The first time we met was a long time ago, and <laughs> since then, we have not met yet. But it's it has been this has been a great opportunity to meet people and see what they are doing. Laura is doing a marvelous job, and I think it's amazing the work she has done. And just a little brief about her, her academic trajectory. She started in Italy, where she got the PhD in 1997. And then she moved to Cambridge for a postdoc, a two year, two years postdoc period. And then from Cambridge to back to Italy in Palermo, where she was assistant professor until 2004. And then she moved to Geneva in Switzerland for another four years as associate professor. And from Switzerland, she moved to the US, first to Minnesota for 12 years, around 12 years, where she was director of the chemical center, the chemical theory center, McKnight presidential and endowed the chair, distinguished McKnight, McKnight University professor. And since the last year, she is she has been in Chicago, where she is Richard and Kate Leventhal Professor, Director of Chicago Center of Theoretical Chemistry, and Director of the Inorganic Catalyst Design Center. And I, I had just summarized the, the many awards she has, and I selected randomly a few per year. And the first one I want to highlight is the the best, the, the highest mark graduation student in chemistry in Italy. And in 2004, she was awarded with the International Academy of Quantum Molecular Science to scientists under 40 years old. In 2014, she got the distinguished Knight University professor in Minnesota. 2016, Zaya Shavit Lectorship Award in Israel. 2017, she was elected member of the World Association of Theoretical and Computational Chemistry. 2018, elected member of the Academy Europea. 2019, awarding theoretical chemistry from the Physical Chemistry Division of American Chemical Society. 2019, again, elected member of International Academy of Molecular Science. And 2020, last year, she was elected for the American Academy of Arts and Science and the Bay, Peter Debye Award in Physical Chemistry for American Chemical Society. Oh, yeah, she, there are just a few of them. And she also has a very active, very active activity in editorships. Nowadays, she is associate editor of Journal of Chemical Theory and Computation and member of the editorial advisory board of Physical Chemistry, Chemical Physics, Journal of Catalysts, Chemical Reviews, American Chemical Society, uh, American Chemical Society Central Science, and Theoretical Chemistry Account, just the, which are, uh, she is working nowadays. Among her research interests, I highlight the development of quantum chemical methods. She is going to talk about some of them today, and homogeneous and heterogeneous catalysis, gas separation, also uh, will be uh, the topic of the, the, her seminar today, and actinide chemistry. And she all also involved in software development, for instance, open MOCAS and implement the density matrix renormalization group in PSI SCF, and also in quantum mechanical, molecular mechanical methods. And a few numbers about her activities. She has around uh, 400 papers with an uh, index, index 
uh, age index of 78 and around 22,000 citations. So she has, uh, she, she has a brilliant career and it's a great pleasure to welcome uh, her here today. I ask you to make questions at the end, keep your microphone mute, and I'm sure all of you will enjoy her presentation. Thank you for being with us, Laura. I'm going to close my, my presentation so you can start yours. Okay, just a minute, please. Uh, Okay, now I think you can share your screen. Yes, I can. So, well, before I start, Good thank you. you. Can, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Yeah. So, thank you very much, Antonio, for this uh, great presentation. <laughs> it's too much what you said. I just have been lucky in my life uh, to meet wonderful collaborators. Uh, there is only one thing I want to correct in what you said. Okay. So, uh, it's it's new thing. So, I, I was actually associate editor for JCTC until the end of 2020. And uh, since uh, the beginning of 2021, I am associate editor with uh, JAX. Uh, wow. And um, I think my my role is to try to um, also bring more theory to, to JAX because uh, JAX uh, historically has always been a little, um, I mean, as considered theory a little bit second tier, but I hope uh, uh, with my presence and the presence also of another theorist, uh, Aaron Walsh, uh, things uh, will change. Okay, mm -hmm. with that, uh, let me start with my presentation. Uh, so, um, can you see my, my screen full screen? Yeah, not not true. Yes, yes, you can. Yeah. It's, it's, and do you see my cursor or not? No. Okay, let me try. Uh, how about if I use this one, the laser pointer? Okay. Do you see my? Yes. Okay. All right. Okay, so, um, well, it's uh, my pleasure to, to be here. And uh, today I will talk about um, yeah, some of the development that we do in my group in terms of um, study of electronic uh, methods for electronic excited states and transition metal compounds. And I like to put this image um, uh, at the beginning in my title slide. Uh, this is uh, the word surrounded by a a molecule in this case is a metal organic framework but uh, the meaning is that uh, uh, chemistry really uh, allows us to be global it's a global science uh, uh, and it allows us to interact with people all over the world uh, without uh, any barriers so taking into account all gender or races all geographical places so i just want to start with a slide in which i summarize the the, the interest uh, in terms of applications in my group uh, or um, Antonio already did it so maybe I can go fast here but we work on many problems that are related to what I like to call is sustainable energies and so we go from catalysis to uh, gas separation, so for example, CO2 separation in um, porous materials. And then we study um, quantum materials, uh, both at the molecular level or extended level. And these involve sometimes um, actinides, as Antonio was mentioning, and uh, uh, also photovoltaics uh, materials. But so the, the unifying uh, um, theme about, uh, for all these systems, whether they are at the molecular level, like the molecule you see on the right, or the um, more extended, is that uh, uh, we need a balanced uh, quantum mechanical treatment. And uh, these are usually so-called multi-reference systems, where there are many electronic configurations that are all important. And uh, the conventional methods uh, uh, to study these systems and uh, to set up these multi-reference wave functions are very expensive, and uh, they can be used for, for small uh, systems. So our long-term goal is to develop uh, new methodologies uh, based on multi-reference uh, wave functions uh, so that they can be used for extended systems strongly correlated and that go beyond the, um, the workhorse of uh, quantum chemistry which is uh, Consham density functional theory, which has, uh, um, I mean, some limitations when we study these uh, 
excited states or transition metals. So I want to start by showing you a, a typical example uh, of um, limitations of density functional theory. And so this is a, a study that was performed a few years ago by um, uh, Chad Hoyer, who was a student, now is a postdoc uh, um, and uh, at University of um, Washington in Seattle. And so he studied a data set with uh, 23 electronic excitations of various nature. And uh, um, these are the typical uh, average mean unsigned error that one obtains. And so CASPT2, and we'll talk more about this method later, gives a, a good result. This is what, um, I mean, is, is acceptable, is uh, one hopes to get this kind of accuracy. If you use a PBE, which is a generalized GGA functional, very basic, uh, one gets a rather bad results. If one uses the, um, the hybrid version of PBE, the, the result is better, but uh, not as good as CASPT2. And these calculations were run within the TDDFT uh, framework. Of course, uh, uh, one can tell me, I'm sure there is a functional that for this data set will give uh, better results. And I'm sure there is. But then one starts really um, um, trying a best functional for every application and uh, there is not a systematic way of studying these problems. So on the other hand, if we look at these wave function based methods, uh, and uh, here I apologize if for some of you this is trivial, but maybe there are some students in the audience. So I will spend one minute explaining what uh, the active space is. So you see, if you have a molecule um, and you use a, you do a heart refoc or DFT calculation, usually the orbitals are divided up into occupied and unoccupied, and one has this. Uh, static, uh, unique way of describing the system. And uh, this works fine if you have a, a very large, hopefully, and well-defined homo lumo gap. However, when you study these uh, systems containing transition metals and uh, excited states, um, the, the, the electronic states are all closed in energy. So one can uh, uh, define this uh, active space, so, which is a selection of orbitals and uh, electrons, and allow these electrons to occupy these orbitals in all possible ways. And this is the complete active space wave function. The problem with this wave function is that um, uh, the cost scales exponentially with the number of electrons and orbitals that you can put here. And so one reaches the limitation of the method uh, pretty uh, soon. I mean, with Antonio, we studied um, multiple bonds in um, um, dimers in the periodic table. We studied chromium-2, molybdenum-2, um, tungsten-2. We have a very nice paper. It's, it's really good paper, Antonio. I loved to work with you on that. And this is, was, was great work. But if you start having, instead of having two chromium, you have three chromium atoms or four, uh, things get uh, bad right away. And but moreover, to be uh, quantitative, one needs to um, also do a post-cast treatment to recover the remaining uh, uh, electron, electron correlation, what we call dynamic electron correlation. And this, for example, is done with the, the CASPT2 approach. So, um, also going this way has limitations. So, so what the challenges that we would like to try to address are the following. Can we combine the best of the two worlds? So use multi-reference wave functions, but also uh, in a DFT uh, formulation so that uh, one can uh, capture all electron correlation uh, in one way. And this would be uh, an alternative to perturbation theory, which instead is more expensive because even if you do the CAS, doing PT2 on top of that means uh, computing higher order density matrices. And so the calculation becomes uh, prohibitive. And also, selecting these active spaces can be really uh, exhausting. It requires uh, um, experience, uh, trial and error. So can we propose some general prescriptions also to handle larger active spaces, not just within the, the CAST uh, formulation? And so, <clears throat> 
I will start talking about a method that uh, we have been developing in collaboration with uh, uh, my colleague John Trular at the University of Minnesota, which is called Multi-Configuration Pair Density Functional Theory. And it's in this spirit of combining the two words. So MCPDFT um, evaluates a um, so-called on-top density functional, uh, which is a functional uh, of the total density and the on-top pair density of a multi-configuration wave function. And on top pair density, I will show you an equation later, but it's basically the, the trace of the two-body density matrix. So it includes uh, more information about, uh, for example, the probability of finding an electron on top of each other in space. And uh, um, so what it does, it computes the, the total energy, and in particular, the electron correlation energy in an unpartitioned way. So it's not like in cas pt 2 where you say I do static and dynamic. Here we just compute the energy in one shot using, we use a, the kinetic energy from the multi-configuration wave function, and then the density, the on-top pair density, and on-top density functional obtained from this uh, um, multi-configuration wave function. Uh, the, so we don't use the uh, multi-configuration energy, and so in this way we do not uh, encounter the problem that uh, is always mentioned when people try to combine these two words of uh, double counting uh, um, of electron correlation, of the correlation energy. So here I want to show you the, the, the fundamental equation and uh, I will show it in a, from a DFT perspective. So in, um, in Consham DFT, uh, one has a single Slater determinant uh, as uh, it's the Consham determinant. In MCPDFT, the wave function is a linear combination of determinants or configuration state functions. And then the energy in Consham is the, this um, um, functional of the total density. In uh, this theory, we have the, the total density and the uh, on-top pair density. So, for example, the, the kinetic energy term that you see here has the same expression, but the wave function is different. The nuclear electron attraction has the same expression, but the density is different in this case because it comes from this uh, MC wave function. And the same is, is uh, true for the classic uh, uh, Coulombic repulsion, where we have different densities, but the expression is the same. And finally, in Consham DFT, we, we, we have the so-called exchange correlation energy functional. In this theory, we, we call it the on-top functional, because it's a functional of the total um, density and the on-top uh, uh, pair density. So, but the energy is computed uh, in one shot uh, um, without uh, a post. So it's not that uh, we, we, we do first uh, one part of the energy and then a second part of the energy. And um, um, so ideally one would like to develop functional forms for, for this particular expression. But uh, what we are actually doing at the moment, so we will one will develop these new functionals, but as a first step, we simply translate previously developed exchange correlation functionals of spin densities. So we, we, we start from our um, on top pair density and total density, and uh, we express in terms of these two quantities, the spin densities, so we call them translated spin densities, and then we go back to uh, functional forms of Consham. And so um, we, we will show results, I will show results with what we call the translated density functionals. So for example, TPB, TBLIP, uh, uh, and so on. So now uh, I added to the previous table um, the TPB uh, column, and uh, you see that the results uh, are very encouraging. So for this data set, TPB performs uh, um, similarly to, to CAS PT2, sorry. And uh, this is done again using a, a state average, uh, complete active space SCF uh, wave function. So the method is quite promising, both for excitation energies and also for um, reactions, so for example, uh, barrier heights uh, or for breaking bonds and so on. So I want to show you also the advantage in terms of uh, timings and memory. So here on, uh, on, the, um, um, on the left, you see uh, we have the time of the calculations. So these are performed in MOLCAS and uh, uh, these are I, sort, sort of 
toy systems with is a um, series of hydrogen molecules so each hydrogen molecule is a uh, two in two active space so if we go from one molecule to 18 molecules to eight molecules so this means that we go from a um, two in two active space to the 16 16 active space and you can see the time i mean for us for small casts, there is not a major difference, but when we go to these big, larger active spaces, we see that cas 2 really uh, increases uh, significantly in terms of time, while uh, TPB, I mean, comes almost for free once you have done your, um, your cas scf calculation. And the same is true uh, in terms of memory. So really this method uh, in terms of memory is much less requiring than uh, cas 2 so um, now the point is, okay, so far I've talked about using the CAS SCF as a wave function, but what if we want to study bigger systems, uh, uh, more transition metals or an extended organic systems? And so over the years, so we have worked with a restricted active space uh, concept, uh, which was uh, developed uh, again in the 80s by Bjorn Roos and uh, Peroke Manquist. And uh, the idea here is that uh, uh, instead of having everything in one big box, you define three subspaces, RAS1, RAS2, and RAS3. And basically, in RAS1, you have doubly occupied orbitals, and uh, you allow excitations from RAS1 to RAS2 and RAS3 up to a certain level that the user defines. So for example, doubles. And the same in RAS3, these are initially empty, and you allow excitations to these orbitals uh, uh, up to a level defined by the user. We have extended this idea and uh, uh, introduced the concept of generalized active space in which uh, the user defines these boxes um, and uh, the rules. So, so for example, there can be inter-box excitations or, uh, sorry, intra-box excitation or inter-box excitation. And of course, these are ways to, to still have a large active space but control the size of the wave function. And we have used these approaches in combination with uh, uh, PDFT. But today I want to talk about something more recently that we did, which is uh, uh, use the density matrix renormalization group uh, as a, a starting wave function. So DMRG is a, um, is a mathematical algorithm to solve uh, um, the full CI ansatz in a simplified way. And uh, uh, I will spend one slide explaining it. Uh, I, again, I apologize if this is trivial for people, but maybe there are some students in the audience. So uh, the idea here, if you have your, your full CI wave function, you can express it uh, as a, in terms of these uh, um, vectors, uh, tensor vectors. And uh, these coefficients uh, as, um, can be written as uh, um, tensor products. And uh, um, I mean, here, they, these are matrices of increasing size, usually they the size increases within the, the middle of this product, and then uh, it uh, decreases. And so one can write the, the full CI wave function uh, in this way, in terms of these uh, matrices. And of course, there is no gain so far, because the problem has the same dimensionality. But what one can do is uh, uh, reduce, approximate the size of these matrices uh, by um, a value, we call it uh, mm, a bond, a bond is M value. And of course, the, the smaller is M, <coughs> that M you can think that it describes the entanglement uh, um, among all these uh, um, vectors. The smaller is M, the, the, the cheaper the method will be. And so usually um, this M is a, a parameter that one uh, defines in the DMRG calculation. And so uh, one can write this DMRG wave function. That, and of course, the larger is M, the closer we are to the full CI, but the more expensive the calculation becomes. The problem, I mean, DMRG is promising, but uh, first of all, I mean, the, how good it approximates for uh, CAS SCF depends on uh, your M value. And also, as CAS SCF, DMRG alone is, is not enough. You need to do something uh, post DMRG. And people, for example, do DMRG PT2, 
we, but it's very expensive. So what we have been doing is to combine a DMRG with pair density functional theory. This is as uh, um, Antonio mentioned. And uh, this has been done in collaboration with uh, Stefan Knecht, uh, who um, is the, one of the developers of this uh, QC Mackey's the DMRG uh, code. And this work has been done by my student Prachi Sharma, who now is a postdoc. And so I will start now showing you some results. And uh, so as a first application of this DMRG PDFT, we studied some um, highly conjugated systems on so some polyene and polyacene. Uh, and we looked at, at, the, um, at different, um, I mean, at the extended chains. And we considered as an active space all the pi and pi star orbitals. And this is not affordable with standard CAS SCF when you go to large chains. So I will show you results about uh, the polyenes. So here you see for this uh, bond dimension m equal 50 in the DMRG, when we will look at other m's later, we looked at these different uh, um, polyenes. So here n goes from one to nine. And if we just use the pi pi star active space, uh, we have in total in the first case, we have two electrons in two orbitals, but then we go to 18 in 18. And we are computing the vertical singlet triplet uh, gap. Um, and these numbers are in electron volt. And so you see the DMRG uh, versus the DMRG PDFT. And what one notices here is that uh, for small active spaces, so short chains, so the, the values are, are quite similar. But then when we start going to, to larger active spaces, there is a big difference, which means that you need to go beyond DMRG. DMRG alone has not converged. But also, let's look now at uh, DMRG PDFT versus CASPT2 when affordable. And then here there are some experimental values uh, um, as reference. And you see, um, again, the DMRG uh, uh, agrees pretty well with, uh, with CASPT2, which means that, uh, I mean, uh, in these cases where CASPT2 is not affordable, these values, uh, I mean, they, they can be taken seriously, they, they maybe are reliable. Also, the other thing that is important to notice is that DMRG versus CAS-SCF, so CAS-SCF is the, um, the reference for DMRG, the agreement is, is good for uh, small active spaces, but when we go to these uh, larger active spaces, uh, the numbers start differing quite a lot, which means that uh, DMRG is not such a good approximation to CAS-SCF, while on the other hand, DMRG PDFT uh, agrees quite well with, uh, with CAS-PT2. So even if you, the parent wave function is, is not always good, things uh, start, start getting better. I also want to show you the, um, the convergence of DMRG and DMRG pair density functional theory with um, um, in respect to CAS-SCF and CAS-PDFT as a function of M, this uh, bond dimension. And so here you see the difference between the DMRG energy and CAS-SCF energy uh, for different chains as a function of M. And you see that, uh, I mean, you need perhaps to go to M equal 100 or 500 to get good agreement. And you, you, we saw this difference before in the table between DMRG and CAS-SCF. On the other hand, DMRG PDFT converges with respect to um, CAS PDFT uh, for much smaller values uh, of M. So this means that uh, we can use, for example, an M equal 50 or 100, and at least for these systems, uh, the results are, are quite encouraging. I also want to show you the timing uh, of these calculations. So. Once you have done a, a CAS SCF, so here, for example, we see the DMRG alone, which, sorry, the DMRG, not the CAS, the DMRG, DMRG PDFT comes for free once you have done uh, uh, DMRG, while the CAS PT2 really uh, increases uh, uh, significantly. So to summarize uh, this part of my talk, um, DMRG PDFT can be used to study systems with uh, active spaces that are not affordable with standard CAS PDFT. We looked at these uh, um, um, singlet triplet gaps of polyenes and polyacenes as the first application, and DMRG PDFT uh, 
requires 1% of the time of the DMRG calculation. So it's, it's quite uh, um, promising. Now I want to show you another application of the method, but this is in transition metal chemistry. And this is a dichromium compound. Uh, again, um, uh, my, one of my most cited papers is with Antonio Borin about the chromium-chromium multiple bond. This uh, species that I'm going to show today is not a direct chromium-chromium bond. But the idea is that these uh, uh, polymetallic systems uh, could be promising uh, uh, units to con construct uh, uh, qubits uh, that can be used for quantum computers. And so um, we have studied a very um, a classical system that uh, has been studied by many other people just to, to see how uh, DMRG PDFT and RAS PDFT were uh, performing. And we have looked at this dichromium system. It's a chromium dimer. There is this uh, bridging unit in the middle. And uh, um, if one looks at these di di dimetallic, uh, and we are interested in their magnetic properties, uh, one quantity that uh, one calculates is the magnetic coupling constant, which uh, can be obtained from the calculation as a difference from the energy of the high spin state minus the low spin state divided by the, um, the difference between the, um, I, the eigenvalues of S square for the two uh, systems. And so the, the challenge here is to determine the correct spin ordering and magnetic coupling, and also try to understand the nature of the magnetic coupling between uh, the two spin centers. So let's see what, uh, what one can obtain with, uh, with density functional theory. So these uh, results are obtained from the, the previous two papers. And we have uh, here on the left, uh, we have have um, just the experimental spin ladder and on the right we have experiment it's the same but in a much more extended scale and uh, some results obtained with uh, with consham density functionals and in general what we see is that uh, all these calculations predict the s equal three state to be mm, low which is wrong and also these uh, ladders are much more expanded uh, corresponding to experiment so <clears throat> we can say that dft fails and why because uh, it uses uh, broken symmetry solutions for all the spin states uh, except for the closed shell and the highest spin state and these are not eigenfunctions of s square however to be honest uh, um, this paper also that points out uh, this problem says that it can actually be solved by doing spin uh, purification in DFT. So if one really makes sure that the intermediate spin states are obtained properly, then uh, um, these uh, high uh, intermediate spin states, they, they go down between S0 and S3. So um, in principle, this can be solved, but of course you need to know the answer in advance and be able to manipulate all these different spin states. In CAS-SCF, we don't have these problems because we have uh, um, spin eigenfunctions. So we started with a, a small active space, uh, six uh, electrons in the 10 3D orbitals. These are chromium 3 plus with uh, three electrons uh, each. And, uh, um, and so we did CAS-SCF and uh, cas PDFT. And here you can see the values. You see, first of all, the J experimental negative 66 wave numbers. And now we have the, the spin ladders with the various methods and the corresponding J value. So these are two different CAS-SCF calculations, one from us, one from the, the previous paper, from Nese's paper. They are supposed to be exactly the same. They are not we were not able to reproduce their numbers by the wave numbers, but they are pretty sh sh close, and the two J values are close. And then we have CAS PDFT. Uh, J gets uh, much closer to experiment, but not perfect. Um, and then we have this is uh, um, CAS with NAVPT2, and these are two different uh, uh, zeroth order Hamiltonian in the PT2 treatment, but they give uh, quite similar results. These are from the NASES paper. So, what we can say is that uh, CAS PDFT improves over CAS SCF, like also NAVPT2, but uh, um, still uh, we are off. So what we decided to do now is to expand the active space, and we use a RAS wave function, 
and uh, uh, DMRG, and uh, uh, we are looking at uh, um, 30 electrons in 22 orbitals. This includes also the, the, the correlating D shell and also some uh, uh, ligand orbitals to try to understand whether there is a, a participation of the ligand uh, um, and so if it affects the magnetic properties. And so here we have the experimental value, negative 60, what, what was it, 66 weight numbers. We have Conchamp PB that does pretty bad. And then we have the three parent wave functions. And they, they improve a little, but not much compared to the six uh, in six. So they, this active, this large active space alone are not uh, uh, enough to recover the full value of the coupling constant. On the other hand, if we do PDFT on top of these wave functions, so we get uh, a very good agreement. And here, DMRG1, DMRG2 are just uh, uh, different gases in the DMRGs, which makes a little difference, but we, we are pretty close. So this shows that you need to go past uh, the wave function, and PDFT is certainly a practical way to do that. We also wanted to understand the nature of this mechanism, how this magnetic coupling mechanism occurs. And so there are two uh, possibilities. Usually it can occur either through super exchange, which means that the um, a closial ligand is, uh, is involved, or uh, there could be so-called direct coupling through space. And uh, uh, in the literature, there has been a lot of debate of which of these two mechanisms is responsible for the magnetic properties. So what uh, uh, we obtain from the um, pair density functional calculation is a, an important quantity, which is the unpaired electron density, which is the difference between the alpha and beta density, but after the translation has occurred. And uh, usually, if one has a, a DFT, a constant calculation, and has a rho alpha, rho beta, the difference is zero uh, for, for example, in a pure singlet state. Why uh, D is usually, this uh, unpaired electron density is usually non-zero. And so I want to show you briefly what the meaning of this quantity. So finally, I show you the functional expression. So this is a functional of rho and pi, but actually what we do, we, we convert it into a functional of rho alpha, rho beta translated, and eventually their um, first derivatives, uh, because we are working with GGA functional expression. And here you can see the translation rule. So basically we, we apply these, these are, um, a translation prescription from the on top pair density and the total density to obtain the uh, translated uh, uh, rho alpha and rho beta uh, proposed by uh, Purdue. Um, um, it was a way to deal with the, the, um, the symmetry dilemma uh, in Concham. And this translation uh, works also for these uh, uh, multi-reference wave functions. We have to to make sure that uh, we control this quantity because uh, when it becomes uh, uh, smaller than one, then we have to deal with uh, uh, imaginary and complex quantities. So now we are plotting this ampere density uh, and we are looking at three different planes of the molecules and we are looking at two different uh, uh, active spaces. So if we uh, have the, the small active space, uh, we basically see no, no density uh, on the ligand. The, the density uh, on the ligand uh, is basically shown uh, on the XY or XZ plane. And so uh, this active space gives a, a negative va a value of J of 39 wave numbers. This means that these 39 wave numbers uh, comes from direct exchange because there is no ligand involvement. On the other hand, when we go to larger active spaces, we see some unpaired density on the ligand. And so going from negative 39 to negative 68 is about an extra negative 30 weight numbers. And this is um, due to super exchange, so ligand uh, participation. So um, to summarize this uh, part of my talk, um, 
we basically, to perform this calculation and describe things correctly, we needed uh, an active space that contains uh, both the chromium valence electrons and the ligand orbitals. And also, it's enough to not just uh, have this huge wave function, but do a post-SCF uh, treatment, like, for example, PDFT treatment, to get to the, the correct spin gap uh, spin gap and spin state uh, ordering. And finally, this quantity, the unpaired uh, electron density, uh, was used to understand the magnetic coupling mechanism to uh, analyze the super exchange. And so, in general, this can be uh, a useful quantity. Okay, now, um, I mean, I've been speaking for about 30 minutes, so I will switch a little bit of gear because I promised Antonio that I would talk also about uh, um, uh, catalysis. But first, I want to summarize also um, MCPDFT. So, what is new in this theory? It's new because it evaluates only the classical Coulomb and kinetic energy from the multi-configuration wave function. And uh, the rest of the energy is computed for this uh, on top density functional. There is no double counting of correlation energy. The method describes uh, multi-configurational systems uh, with the, uh, so it really describes spin states, unlike constant DFT. And uh, it scales uh, as the parent wave function. So it could be CAS SCF, GAS, DMRG, but it produces results that in most cases are of are of quality corresponding, for example, to CAS PT2, GAS PT2, or DMRG PT2. And the method is available now in several packages. And uh, we have also developed analytic gradients. So this means that you can uh, compute a potential energy surface and uh, in an analytic uh, way. And in terms of future directions for this method, we are try to understand the active space dependence on the, so how much does the, the final result depend on the active space? And in order to do so, we are trying to automa automate the active space selection by using, for example, machine learning methods. We are also, um, we have also developed another type of wave function called LAS, localized active space, which corresponds to a real, physical uh, spatial localization of little wave functions and we are using PDFT uh, in, uh, in combination with this uh, type of wave function. But now I will move to the second part of my talk uh, and um, I will talk about uh, uh, catalysis. Uh, um, so there will be a switch, okay? Maybe now the experimentalists, if there are experimentalists in the audience, they wake up. And uh, so, uh, this is another effort on which we're working in the in the group, uh, and uh, it's about catalysis. And uh, we are looking both at molecular catalysts, but also some uh, uh, supported catalysts, so heterogeneous catalysis. Um, and in particular, uh, at the moment, we are uh, focusing on reactions related to natural gas conversion. This is a project that started a few years ago during the Trump administration, so natural gas conversion seemed a good topic. We are going to switch to decarbonization soon, but these are the results that I have. And uh, among other things, even if this is the, um, let's say, the, the mission, uh, in reality, we are looking at reactions that are very fundamental to many processes. So, but what I, I, we're talking is about this uh, uh, small olefins, so C4. Uh, C1 to C4, and for example, study uh, dehydrogenation or hydrogenation and uh, selective oxidation, for example, conversion of methane to methanol. So, in general, is the manipulation of these uh, CC bonds in these uh, small alkanes. And uh, uh, so what we are doing is uh, using as catalyst, uh, uh, the idea is to use um, so these uh, metal organic frameworks, uh, which are these uh, um, hybrid uh, sponges as catalyst or as catalyst uh, supports. So, and here I want to show you, I have this little video, which probably I have to show by uh, removing the laser pointer for a second. I hope it works. Yes, it works. So this is about, uh, uh, well, it's 
because it's going very slow over the internet. Uh, so probably I have to to stop it. Okay, I didn't realize that it will go so slowly. Or maybe I have to stop sharing my screen. Let's see. Uh, are you still seeing my screen? Hello, is anybody yes, seeing my screen? Yes, yes. yes. and okay. so I will show you this uh, video like this. So let's see if I can. Um, no, I cannot. It doesn't work. Okay, well, I go, well, it works really slowly on the internet. Let me see if I can go to the end. Uh, anyway, this is the final material that you make, okay? And uh, um, this material, oops, are you still there? No. Do you see my screen or no? No. Yes, yes. Yes. No, not full screen, not full screen. Oh. Okay, let me just uh, go back. Okay, uh, how, how about now? Do you see the full screen now? Yes. So we make this, these are porous materials. And here I just show you um, a snapshot of one of these uh, pores. And so they are composed by uh, organic linkers and uh, these uh, um, colored are metal oxides nodes. And so what one can do is, for example, attach a molecule that could be a, a, a catalyst or modify the composition of the node and have different catalytic properties modify the organic uh, part and uh, have, uh, again, different catalytic properties, put a nanoparticle inside your uh, void, or, for example, um, use the, the node as a, as a support for another little metal oxide, and which is the catalyst. So these are all ways in which these uh, um, materials can be used for catalysis. So um, today I'm going to tell you a story about uh, converting methane and ethane and propane to um, their corresponding oxides, so the alcohols, sorry, the alcohols, so methanol, uh, ethanol, and propanol. And the reason for, this is an important reaction, uh, also industrially, because um, once they are liquefied, their transport uh, is facilitated and it has uh, many advantages. So this is the kind of uh, reactions that uh, we are we are interested in and this is of course a reaction that uh, occurs in, in nature and uh, um, there are a lot of molecular systems these are for example iron 4 species that are capable of activating uh, light alkanes in biological systems and these are some of the of the molecular systems that some, one of my colleagues at Minnesota Larry Kay for example is famous for working on these molecular systems if we think more about heterogeneous catalysts, um, there, has, there has been an interest also in iron-based materials and uh, um, some zeolites uh, with, with this iron uh, oxo unit have been synthesized and characterized. And zeolites are porous materials are, as well, but they have only the inorganic part. They don't have the organic part as MOFs. And so, for example, there is this iron BEA, it's a name. The characteristics of these systems is that uh, you have to have, uh, so the iron has to be reduced to iron 2 to be catalytically active. It has to be surrounded by, by four oxoligand and uh, it has to be in a high spin and also uh, the catalyst has to be able to work at room temperature. And so there are these uh, metallozeolites, uh, but they they have some um, constraints. Uh, and uh, so the question is, uh, can one design a MOF having a similar iron two center? And the beauty of MOF is that you're really, you can engineer them um, uh, in more ways than a zeolite. A zeolite is this particular, it's not that you can change it very much. But so uh, there has been a lot of research also in MOF chemistry uh, in terms of iron ox, iron oxo, iron base catalysts. For example, there is this uh, um, material, it's called uh, iron magnesium DOBDC. DOBDC is uh, this linker, and uh, it's called iron magnesium because uh, they usually make the material with magnesium and then they, they, re they replace some of the magnesium centers with uh, uh, iron. And this material, um, 
uh, has, um, has been known for catalyzing ethane uh, to ethanol. However, um, it has some limitations. So the loading, the quantity of iron that is present is very low because if you put more, then the material will, will destroy. And also it has low thermal and air stability and it's able to catalyze ethane to ethanol, but not uh, methane to methanol. So the question is, uh, could we envision another material with isolated iron atoms so there is not the same problem as uh, here in which you, you have to dope the original material. And so um, there are some uh, um, interesting uh, systems, so though these are tr uh, tri-iron oxocenter clusters, and this is a common motif in uh, some moths. So um, originally the iron, iron 3 plus, and then the idea is to uh, reduce one of them. So for example, there is this material called mill 100 uh, with iron, in which you have these nodes, which are basically iron oxide. So here in orange is iron, in red uh, is oxygen. And uh, they are connected through these linkers to other nodes. And this is uh, uh, the linker no, that, that, yes? Sorry, I cannot see your pointer. Ah, okay, okay. All right, you're right. Sorry, I, I forgot. So this Thank is you. the linker here on the on the bottom um, right. So uh, again, these are the uh, um, the metal oxide clusters, and these are the linkers. So what we have done, and this was work done by Jenny Vitillo. Now Jenny is an um, um, assistant professor in Italy. Is a theoretical study um, uh, in which we wanted to understand and see the conversion of methane, ethane, and propane to the corresponding alcohol using this uh, um, iron MOF uh, as a catalyst. And so this is here on the right is the, the node of the catalyst, which you see as these three iron metals. And then, of course, uh, where there is a little hydrogen, the linker starts. Uh, we have, however, we have really performed a, a cluster calculation, so we haven't considered the entire material. We have just considered this node. And uh, um, the question is, uh, if we replace uh, two of these irons with chromium and aluminum, so create some mixed nodes, will the catalytic properties of this system uh, uh, be affected at all? And here you see some of the details of the calculations. So I want to uh, show you that one of the, the major questions is, of course, uh, what is the spin state that you should consider for these systems? So uh, in the, okay, aluminum, when you consider the aluminum, aluminum is, um, is closed shell, so it's not a problem. If you have this uh, iron or chromium, so they are in high spin states uh, individually. However, the, the overall spin of the, the system varies uh, with the nature of these uh, uh, M1 and M2 centers. And so, for example, in this uh, um, mixed aluminum iron, we have uh, uh, really the high spin state uh, is the, the ground state. For these other clusters, uh, the, the, the most stable spin states uh, really depends on how the, the, the M1 and M2 centers uh, couple, uh, and most of the time there is an antiferromagnetic coupling. So I just want to uh, say that because this is really a challenging problem from an electronic structure point of view. And so, for example, if we consider the, the iron system, which, uh, you know, one of the three um, irons has to become a two plus to initiate the oxidation procedure. So if we have these systems, let's see what different methods say. So this, what I report here is the spin multiplicity. And you see cas scf and cas pt 2 they basically tell you that uh, all spin states are almost degenerate uh, within uh, uh, less than 50 kilojoules per mole. But if you look at M06L, you see that the results are all over the map. So one is to take this into account. However, at the end of the day, we were very pragmatic and we said, okay, all the methods think, I mean, they say that the high spin state is, is not too high in energy compared to what is probably the lowest spin state. So let's follow the high spin state when we do the DFT calculations. But this is an approximation. The other thing that is important is that uh, if we want to have really one iron like two plus and 
two iron three plus this uh, does not uh, emerge from the dft dft uh, delocalizes uh, everything while with caspt2 we we can reach this uh, um, localization of the of the charge and of the spin and so we have these are the some caspt2 calculations that we performed with the d orbitals on the three um, irons so now let's uh, look at the catalytic cycle so we we follow this cycle based on some previous work and, and it seems uh, reasonable we'll see later if it is or not so we have uh, six uh, steps uh, with three transition states so basically we have to to start with this uh, system in with the top iron so here this iron that i show you here iron two is the top one is iron two plus as an oxidant we use N2O, it's a mild oxidant. The, the problem is one, if one uses oxygen is that, um, I mean, a lot of side reactions may start. And so the first step is the adsorption of N2O. And then there is a, from AO to B, the formation. So iron two plus becomes an iron four plus. So there is the oxidation of, uh, of iron. And, uh, and then there is the, the alkane that comes in, so the alkane is uh, adsorbed. And then there is this uh, uh, CH uh, bond dissociation session, and this is from uh, C uh, to D. And then um, there is a series of intermediate steps here, but the idea here is that uh, when you have dissociated your CH bond, uh, you, you form an alcohol that then is um, ex uh, expelled and uh, then the catalyst uh, is regenerated. So this seems like a, a reasonable cycle to follow. And now I want to show you, and these are the FT results. So what we are showing here is the delta H uh, of the various steps. So we start from the, um, this uh, A is our cluster plus uh, uh, N2O plus the alkane. And then we have the first step, uh, which is this uh, ferrile formation. So the, um, the iron uh, for oxygen formation, which has a rather high barrier. If we look at the previous work on this um, other material, we see that the barrier is, uh, is quite higher. And then we have the, um, the CH bond scission. And here we have looked at the three alkanes so CH4, C2H6, so methane, ethane, and propene. And uh, we see the, the high height of this uh, step. Of course, the, the, the longer the chain, the, the, so we see that it goes from uh, uh, CH4 is 60, then it gets a little less, uh, and uh, 17 for propane. And uh, remember, methanol is the, the, the big one. And so these numbers, this is how they compare to uh, MOF uh, 74. And finally, we have the, the last step, which is the, the last two steps, the, the radical rebound and the desorption. Uh, so, so basically, um, the active the, the desorption is an enthalpy which is not as high as the ferrile formation. However, it's sufficiently high that uh, basically, if we really had a catalytic process, so one would have to remove the alcohol before starting the new uh, cycle. So these are the results that we obtained with the, the all uh, iron uh, cluster. But then we looked at these uh, um, mixed nodes. And the idea is uh, does changing the, the bottom uh, irons, which are more spectators, they don't intervene, but they can change the whole charge picture. Does it make any difference? And here you see, this is the, the first step, which is the highest step for different uh, uh, clusters. So the, the, the original one, that one that we studied, the, the uh, three irons is, uh, is here behind the blue. But what is interesting to see is that if we look at this uh, aluminum, aluminum iron, the difference here between uh, um, the, 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 the two um, local minima becomes uh, significantly lower, and this barrier is also uh, lowered a lot. And then if we look at the other step, we see that they, they all are parallel. So the only step that is really affected by the, the change of the cluster composition is the uh, ferrile formation. 
So if we look at the same story with methane, okay, the, the first step is the same. We see that, uh, again, uh, um, we have a higher CH activation and alcohol desorption energy than in the ethane case. So it's more this step that is affected, not the second one. So the question is, why is this uh, step, the N2O activation, sensitive to the cluster composition? And so here we, we report the, the energy for this step as a function of the partial charge on the central um, oxygen. And we see that, uh, I mean, the, the partial charge changes a lot as a function of the composition. This uh, iron-3 was the one that we looked at in the beginning, and then at the bottom we have the aluminum-2 iron. So the, the, the oxygen becomes much more negative, and uh, this uh, delta H for the, for the formation of the ferrule goes down significantly. Also, what is interesting is if we look at the iron, so this is the delta H of the formation, sorry, the, this is the delta H of the formation along the x-axis, and here we have the transition state barrier height. So we see that these systems, they basically lie on a um, straight line, and so they, they fulfill the, the so-called Brownst-Evans Polanyi uh, uh, relation for this step. And, uh, and here we see uh, on this curve also three other materials that we considered. So the, um, these are two zeolites and uh, um, the square is a moth. So to summarize this, uh, this study, the um, mil 100 iron is a promising catalyst for methane, ethane oxidation. And what is uh, interesting that iron really functions in an isolated ma matter. It's not like these other materials where they are all interconnected. So one does not need to dilute the iron concentration. The step with the highest activation barrier is the N2O um, activation. Uh, the, um, the CH bond activation instead is about 40 kilojoule for ethane, 60 for methane. And uh, it seems that um, if you dope the, um, the cluster, if you change the composition, Position, this has uh, an effect uh, on the ferrile uh, formation, so this uh, N2O uh, uh, activation step. So we have uh, uh, ongoing experimental collaborations. Uh, I will not uh, um, tell you uh, all the details, but the idea is that the material has been made in the um, uh, lab of one of my colleagues. Uh, Matt Simon is, uh, is an experimental student uh, in, the, um, in the group of my colleague Adi Chabani studying reactivity. So he's really uh, setting up uh, a catalytic study of these systems. And uh, the idea is that he hypothesizes a mechanism as the one that we have proposed uh, in the computational study. But basically what we are seeing is that uh, there are a lot of side products uh, that we did not initially consider and we have to consider in follow-up. Uh, um, studies. He also performed uh, kinetic studies that show, confirm that uh, the mechanism that we proposed, uh, so that uh, the reaction is first order in N2O, zero order, and this is propane, he's studying propane to begin with. So to, to summarize this part, uh, and, and now I'm ready to end my talk, Basically, some preliminary experimental work has been performed on the ethane and propene. With this catalyst, methane is not activated in the lab. But honestly, now they have found a slightly different system. The ligand is different, and they have been able to reach also methane activation. And so there are also some future work to expand the kinetic data and um, understand routes uh, to different products. So now uh, it's time to finish. I want just to tell you, it's a general reflection about, okay, I've talked about methods, I've talked about applications, uh, where should our field go? And um, Jenny made this picture. Today I've talked mainly about the atomistic scale, maybe a little bit of the nanoscale, but really treated with an atomistic perspective. And so one big goal of our community is to bridge uh, all these scales, also uh, the mesoscale. And so the take-home message 
we have to establish consistency between uh, different frameworks and uh, we have as a community and this is a message that i want to give also to young people if you want to enter this field maybe these are the challenges that you have we have to find better ways to represent core electrons valence electrons relativity uh, nuclear electronic interactions uh, have to be treated also um, we have to, to work on that the um, extension of multi-reference methods and effects uh, to study molecules and solids uh, not just molecules and better algorithms for all these problems and algorithms for uh, the computers of tomorrow like for example uh, quantum computers and of course a self-sustained loop between experiment and theory is very important with that i'd like to acknowledge the people who um, have worked on this project so here you see my group um, very geographically diverse and today i mainly talked about the work of prachi but the the people who work on mcpdft are highlighted here so many of them and uh, um, jenny vitillo has been working on the MOF together with matt simons and uh, I would also like to thank my colleague Don Truller at Minnesota for the MCPDFT project and uh, Aditya Ban for the experimental part uh, of the MOF work. And uh, my research is funded by several uh, uh, resources, uh, the Department of Energy, National Science Foundation and the um, Air Force uh, Office. And with that, uh, I will uh, stop sharing my screen uh, and uh, I thank you very much for your attention. And uh, if you have questions, I will be very happy to take them. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Thank you. Very nice talk. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to, to present. It's, and if there are questions, I'm happy to take them. Yes, please. Questions? OK, we have Felix, Felix first. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um. Thanks, Laura, for this talk. I hope. Thank you, you very much, it. Alex. So I was just wondering if there are formal foundations for multi-configuration and pair density functional theory. Like you have the Hohenberg cone theorems, and you have all this discussion about cone sham orbitals. So are the same foundations also there for MCPDDFT? Uh, no, absolutely okay. not. <laughs> so um, there is not, uh, at least we don't have, uh, we have not derived the Hohenberg Cohn theorem. Okay. So um, uh, I think I would say this is a very practical way of uh, computing the energy. Can you, uh, can I, you still see my, my screen? Like I, yeah. I'm showing the yeah. equation, you can see yeah. it. Yeah. yeah. So, um, no, it's a, it's a very practical way. At the moment, we don't have a theorem. Um, and, uh, you know, when I say uh, we don't have double counting of electron correlation, I mean, it's true, but uh, uh, the purists, uh, maybe the physicists, and may, maybe you, are, you have already spotted the problem, is in this uh, um, kinetic energy term. Because, uh, you know, we say we, we take kinetic energy from the the MC uh, wave function. And uh, in Concham, the functional itself corrects, uh, I mean, takes into account the difference between the kinetic energy of the real system and the, the parent wave function. But in this, in this uh, theory, the parent wave function changes as a function of the active space. And so one says, uh, how, how do you deal with that? And we, we don't deal it, with it in a formal way. But we have done a lot of studies that show that um, I mean, the results um, are not so active space dependent when you choose a, a reasonable active space, of course. And uh, um, so it seems the functional can compensate for what the, the wave function brings in or does not bring in. But there is no theorem, yes. OK, thanks. Yeah, makes, makes a lot of sense. Yeah, thank you. And we have not, I mean, we are just borrowing the functionals from Concham yeah. at the moment. Okay. So, okay. yeah. Okay. Thank you, Felix. Next one, Antonio. Thank you, Professor Gagliardi, for the amazing talk. Uh, Thank you. Uh, could you please comment on the choice of uh, functional for uh, MCP DFT calculations? Because one concern that one one has have one when doing DFT is um, how to choose one. 
Uh, is MCPDFT more robust with the choice of the functional? And the second question is, as, as you just said, you borrowed the, the functionals from um, the regular DFT. Uh, would you would would it be necessary to uh, reparameterize this uh, new functions for MSPDFT? Mm -hmm. Thank you. So um, I mean, we we have mainly uh, tried um, GGA functionals, like we have this uh, translated PBE. We have tried to translated BLIP. We have also, you know, the translation, uh, we have two different procedures. Uh, one is called translated, the other is fully translated to ensure that uh, the, um, the curve is smoother. So I would say we have not seen a dramatic functional dependence, but we have tried really with, with very few functionals. And uh, in a way, I mean, TPB uh, works reasonably well, so I would recommend to use it uh, in most cases. Um, however, we have seen well, there are some uh, systems that are more challenging. And for example, um, I talked about singlet triplet uh, excitations in these uh, condensed uh, systems or aromatic systems. Singlet singlet are more challenging. Also, the benzene singlet singlet excitations. Some of them are described better than others. And uh, we have explored that, for example, as a function of the active space. But we also have uh, decided to develop a, um, you know, in PBE, you have a exchange and correlation contribution. So we have done what Don Truller did in, in Concham, the HLE, high local exchange functional. So instead of using the the composition of PBE, we have uh, um, played with those two contributions and increased the exchange with respect to correlation. And in some cases, uh, we have seen that uh, uh, it works. We have also developed a hybrid and CPDFT version. So we have a, a prescription for a hybrid functional. And again, it uh, improves um, certain cases where TP TPBE uh, is not working so far. So we are at the beginning. We are also, what we are doing now actually is trying to develop uh, a correction to TPBE with machine learning. So we are working that direction. We see that there are some cases in which this uh, hybrid or high local exchange improve things, but uh, if uh, I think that at the moment, if you want to use something that uh, generally works well, I would go with TPB. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Laura Antonio. Now, Sebastian, please. So, hi, and also uh, a lot of thanks from me. This was a very nice talk. I liked especially the first half a lot. Thank you. And like my two, uh, like the two other askers, uh, my question is also about MCPDFT, mm -hmm. um, because we recently, uh, yeah, basically noticed that this now is available in open molecules and that there are gradients and there is this multi-state treatment, mm -hmm. and we were planning to use this soon in shark simulations and non adiabatic dynamic simulations. So uh, I, I, we are working on that too, actually. Uh, uh, very uh, nice. So you are, sorry, you are Sebastian May? No, who is speaking? Because yes. I don't see, okay. Sebastian, okay, we are actually, uh, so we have, uh, let's talk about it because we can work on it together. So are you, are, where are you based? Are you with uh, Leticia with or? Exactly, I'm, I'm with Leticia in Vienna and yeah. So actually, one of my postdocs is uh, has developed an interface between uh, MCPDFT and Shark. Uh, do you already have it? Okay. Um, you mean using open molecules? Yes. I guess. Open molecules. Yes. yes. I, I also used the existing Shark molecules interface and made a couple of changes. So there are some things that are already working. But one of my question is. Um, if you do not use this XMS treatment, do you get the same kind of problems as with single state CASPT2? Do you have these double crossings and everything? Yes, uh, depends. Uh, I mean, uh, we see that for your conical intersection, if you want to have the, um, the right uh, uh, topology, you need, uh, we have this, uh, S, uh, we have various uh, SI, PDFT, compressed uh, PDFT. So, um, we needed to do the electronic calculations. 
I'm not sure, however, that this uh, is uh, straightforward to do dynamics. Uh, so if you want to do NAX, I, I don't, I mean, I think the theory needs to be um, uh, revisited because it will not work so, so simply. So at the moment, what we are doing is uh, with dynamics, we do singlet, triplet um, crossing uh, where yeah. you don't have the problem. Yeah. So, so, but if, uh, I mean, if you're interested in working with us, so one of my postdocs is working on it is, uh, and uh, we could, do, we would be very happy to do it with you. Okay. Because you have then, the experience. Yeah, so maybe we will certainly yeah. write can you send this me, email. Yeah, can you send me an email uh, and uh, or we can have a meeting because uh, I also thought that we should reach out to your group because of course uh, you are the expert, but Paul wanted to, to do it alone first and uh, try to see if he could interface open markets with Shark uh, and now he is doing it, it's working already, but uh, for the time being he's doing only single triplet. Okay, yes, so what we usually do is work with wave function overlaps that you can compute with RASI from the mixed mm -hmm. job mm -hmm. files. And then you don't need non elliptic coupling vectors. And with that, I think we could already now do shark simulations, even with singlets and triplets, and also within the singlets and within the triplets and so on. Yeah, I so, have to say, so uh, the wave function is the CASA-CF wave function, okay? Maybe yes. with RAS, you just take the energy. Because, I mean, PDFT, you just have an energy. Yeah, I, I think we can discuss the details in, in some <laughs> other meetings, but one question for here, um, how quickly can we uh, you know, might the, the XMS PDFT Gra gradients get the reality? We are working on that. I okay. know, I know, I know. It's uh, That's what we need, and even if we need this, I'm not sure it will... But, well, then maybe, as you said, we don't have to do NACs, but we are working on that. And today we have yeah. a meeting with Don Trula. Do you want to participate? Well, it's late. It's at uh, 9.30 p.m. your time. Okay. <laughs> Would you like to participate? Yeah, might be interesting. Okay, send me an email and I will invite you to the meeting, okay? Okay, cool. Thanks All right. a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Maria, do you want to ask something? Maria sent a nice sentence. Yes. Thank you, Maria. And by the way, I have to tell you the truth. In the past, it has not worked me, for me to come there because uh, it's a mess. But I love to visit you guys. I've never been. I feel ashamed. I've never been to South America. And uh, this is in my... Yeah, it's yeah, a dream. yeah. It's a dream for me. It's a dream for me. Yeah. I, I hope so because I mean, as soon as I come there, it's over. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Now, Laura, of course, uh, uh, this is not a question, okay? Uh, it's just a comment that this is another way up uh, Jacob's ladder. I, I have just written on it. But have you compared your results with? Uh, with uh, beta sulfate on top of uh, uh, Green's Funk with GW, have you ever compared? Because I just wanted to know, because you know that I'm mostly on on hybrids and uh, beta sulfate equation uh, to, to see um, mostly singlets, sometimes triplets, a singlet triplet, but mostly for, for, for optical excitations. However, it, it, it is very expensive. But yes. yours is also not so not so not so easy. Mm -hmm. We don't say cheap. Cheap is just not not a good yeah. thing to say. However, uh, have you compared your results? Oh, oh I mean, uh, but the uh, salperter is a, a very good method. Of course, uh, it's very expensive methods. Okay, you don't want to use cheap, but it's very expensive. So mm -hmm. I think that uh, also with that method, uh, if you so the problem there is that you have to do DFT to begin with. So you have to make sure that you have the right density. So it's it's yeah. functional yeah. dependent. DFT plus hybrids. Yes, it's functional Usually dependent. Usually now we use hybrids. Yeah, uh, and then beta sulfate on top. And then there is a the question whether you do it uh, iteratively or not. 
Yeah. Like when you do G, G, G. No, I'm talking about G not W not because. Yeah, so uh, it's, you don't do it iteratively. Well, you know, no, we, some of these, uh, so I think this is a very good uh, method. It's, uh, it's not, uh, um, it's probably more expensive that what, than what we are doing, I think, at the end of the day. If you, but, but um, again, I think we use some of these results from, uh, there are a lot of uh, benchmarks from various groups and we use them to, to benchmark uh, our results. So they, 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 it's, it's a very, it's an excellent method. And so, yeah. Yeah, but uh, yeah, I just wanted to know how, how because I, I have used CASP way back. Now I'm mostly on uh, on beta uh, sulfated on top of uh, of uh, DFT. That's um, and also couple clusters. Well, for couple cluster, the problem is um, that it's. I think it's uh, um, the the gold standard for single reference methods. Yeah. For single reference system, sorry. When mm -hmm. you have a, a multi-reference situation, you cannot just do CC as D parenthesis T. It will not work. So you have to find either uh, ways of including multi-reference in a, in a single reference formulation of couple cluster or go to multi-reference couple clusters. Yeah. And they are very expensive. Yeah, so, yeah. 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 Okay. Okay. Well, congratulations, Laura. Thank you so much. It was an honor for me to be there and uh, good luck with everything. And uh, Antonio Borin, I hope we write another paper that will make us famous again in, uh, in the next 10 years or so. Yeah. We are very kind. Yes, I hope so. We will talk about something later. Yeah. We have an idea. We will talk. Yeah. All right. There is a question for you from Natalia. Natalia, uh, 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 hi. Uh, hi, Natalia. <laughs> Natalia, you are supposed to come to me, right? <laughs> yeah, I'm trying like in the last two years, but it's kind of tough to leave. When are you coming? Uh, uh, sorry, what? When are you coming? Uh, I was trying to go on May, however, the the program changed at the COVID situation. Uh, it changed for initial uh, departures from Brazil starting for September to December now. Okay, well, I will I will be there. I move there at the end of May, and my office right. and the, so hopefully this fall is is perfect for everybody. Yeah, okay. thank you. I, I, I'm trying. <laughs> I, I do hope I can go. Do you have a question? Yes, actually. Yeah. Um, I mean, the main advantage of DFT is because mm -hmm. it's a great method to be system, a uh, higher electron number system. Mm -hmm. And, but it comes with one of the main problems that I see working with, uh, that we always have to search for the best functionality to each uh, chemical uh, ch chemical system. And so I would say it's chemical system dependent, they, 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 they choose the functional. Um, and first, uh, and a second, point is Kazasef uh, as as I was seeing in your lecture in your in your, in your presentation uh, you you use it as the um, uh, the pattern I mean to, to benchmark it, the, 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 the the methodology of MC PDFT or M, uh, uh, or the MRG PDFT. Uh, and Casa Cepha is a very costly method for many electron chemical system, like two, like many um, uh, metal system, uh, items. Uh, so, could be, uh, I mean, is MC PDFT and the MRG PDFT? Um, it comes with the same issue of the chemical system depending on the uh, in the time of choose the the, the the functional your the T 
TDF, I would say, um, functionary you're working with. Uh, for so, anytime I will change my 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 system, I will change like to find the function of MC PDFT um, good enough. And however, it's very costly, professionally speaking. So, and if it the why not just use it as a CF if the computational cost and time demanding is apparently for was the same in, in those examples. I mean, so uh, just a second. So, uh, CAS PDFT costs as much as CAS CF. So, okay. Yeah, it, it gives the results that are of better quality. So uh, perhaps I omitted that part because uh, so they, if you just do the CAS SCF alone, it's not good enough. You have to do something on top of that. So either you do PT2 or PDFT. So you can think about PDFT being an alternative not to just the CAS alone, but CAS PT2, but it costs only like CAS SCF. Uh, so there is this aspect. And uh, I also agree with you that there is a functional choice, but in general, we see that uh, if we use this uh, TPB, the results are reasonably good. So we are less, uh, uh, we have less of a, a drama to choose the functional like in Consham DFT. Does it make sense? Yes. <laughs> okay. okay. No, no, no. Thank, you. Thank you very much. Thank you for this uh, very, very interesting question. It's a, it's a, but it's a very important point. And I look forward to having you in, uh, in Chicago. Thank you. I, 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 I hope I can go because sometimes, yeah. as you saw, the, the program, it's being suspended and coming back all the time. It's, quant it's a quantic situation, I would say. Quantic situation, sorry. Uh, well, thank you for this, thank you very this much. opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Natalia. Any other question? Julio, okay. Okay, hi. Hi, Laura. Hi, hi. Uh, okay, I saw you present in your, in your in the fifth slide, fifth, uh, 25, sorry, the slide 25. Uh, you let me just uh, sh uh, show it again. Okay. Slide 25. Okay. Uh, hold on a second. Okay. Yes. Uh, let me. A window. Okay. And I go to slide 25, you said, right? Yeah. Oh. I mean, I'm not sure if. if uh, okay. This one? Question. This one? Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. this one. And I'm not sure if it's a question, but uh, I saw two different results with uh, PDGFT, mm -hmm. right? With different guess, is correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, the results are slightly different. I don't know if this difference is due to, to this system or to this methodology. I mean, uh, um, so uh, remember that here we are talking about a difference. I would have to look at the number again of, uh, so this is 68 and this is 55. So we are talking about a difference of uh, um, uh, 13 wave numbers. But so, um, and uh, so it's, it's different. And uh, of course this difference comes from the fact that the, uh, the relative energies of different uh, uh, states uh, uh, changes with the two gases. And uh, yes, this is a problem of, uh, of the MRG. I mean, um, the, the results are gas dependent. So it's not uh, just uh, the, the PDFT, it's more the MRG that uh, gives uh, results that are gas dependent. So the relative energies of the state, also the DMRG level. You can see it already here in the, if you just look at the MRG one and the MRG two, you see that there is a difference, which mm -hmm. is about, uh, it's a little smaller in this case. In this case, the difference is only two wave numbers for the parent wave function. And this is uh, um, enhanced by PDFT but uh, it, it all comes from the parent wave functions. And so certainly it is uh, something to, to take into account, yes. Mm, okay, but uh, it is some protocol to choose um, a, better, a better guess for, for this case? 
I mean, here the 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 bad actually the ga the gases where whether it's a uh, er, ras and then you do the MRG on top of the ras or you start from the cas. So we we don't uh, I mean we don't really know we don't have a. a a prescription, a fixed prescription. I, we can I, say that, of course, in this case, uh, the MRG2 agrees better with experiment, but uh, I think it's just, uh, it's such a small difference that we, I don't think we can, uh, we can be conclusive. Okay, so I, I, I should uh, try and see what, what happens. Yeah, we are still, I mean, these are the, the first, one of the first applications of these methods to these systems, so we are still learning. I mean, the results are encouraging, but we're learning. Yeah. Okay, okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Well, there is another question for you, Laura, from Daniel. Okay. Daniel. Yes. Let's see, you, you hear me now? Okay. Yes, I can hear you. Hi. Yeah, uh, Nice talk, Laura. Thank you. Yeah, I uh, have a, a question about the second part about the moves. Okay. So, mm -hmm. and also related to the picture that you show at the end, no? moving from the atomistic uh, scale to the mesoscale. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. uh, how important can be to to consider the, the effect of the other uh, metals? I mean, because moves are very extended uh, systems. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, this catalysis, I guess, is mainly localized or uh, there is a role of the other metals or the other nodes? So, um, it is localized. Uh, so, let me, maybe I can stop sharing now and just look at you. So, it is a localized. So, the, the hypothesis is that uh, these are local effects uh, and uh, um, MOFs are better than, for example, metal oxides or zeolites because these uh, nodes are separated by the, the linkers. Mm -hmm. uh, however, it really depends on the material. So, for example, in, um, in the previous one, this MOF 74, if you make the whole material with the uh, irons, uh, uh, the, you don't have the catalysis that we suggested. Actually, uh, if you start doing the oxidation, the material will, will not even be stable. So there is clearly an iron-iron communication and effects. In the, the material that we studied, uh, it seemed instead the communication was, uh, was shut down because of the of the structure of this uh, of this material because of the of the topology of this uh, moth so it it's really dependent but for example what we have noticed is that uh, sometimes uh, maybe not the entire so you don't have a completely delocalized communication but uh, the the other nodes so if you consider a pore let's say that a reaction occurs in one pore uh, the other uh, nodes that are facing inside that pore play a role and uh, and so we have we have studied increasing uh, cluster sizes and in some cases mm -hmm. uh, you need to in increase the cluster size in others maybe the phenomenon is more localized so one has to be very careful and uh, it varies a lot from case to case yeah, you need to check each system yeah, separately yeah, yeah yeah okay nice and um, for the first part of the talk, you you were mentioning uh, the use of machine learning to uh, kind of look for the uh, correct active space. No, can mm -hmm. you mention a little bit more about that? Because it so, looks very interesting. So we have a, a one paper, and we are looking at um, other aspects. So the idea is uh, so what we have done, for example, is. Uh, um, we looked at a class of reactions, they are very simple, these are diatomics, dissociation of diatomics, um, and uh, for first of all, and uh, we have um, considered a uh, lot of combinations of atoms, different systems, and some of them have been used to train a machine learning protocol to, to, so we have explored all possible active spaces that one could afford. Uh, some of them mm -hmm. are totally unphysical. And then uh, the machine has come up with some um, suggestions of what uh, would be the best active space. And we have used these suggestions for systems that were not in a, in a training set. And the results seem to be um, reasonable in the sense that at least we, uh, the machine doesn't say something crazy. Of course, these are uh, ex okay. known systems expected, but we are, we are, for example, now um, trying to, um, yes, uh, find an approach, uh, yes, to um, also 
do some selected CI excitations and uh, maybe do only low level excitations and uh, train the machine on them and the machine extrapolates the results with high level excitations. So we are working okay. in that direction. It's, um, it's interesting. So my idea is that this should be not, uh, it doesn't mean that uh, you, you don't need to run these calculations. Eventually you need to run these calculations, mm -hmm. but uh, for a person who approaches the field and has no idea how to run these calculations, and sometimes they say, I will never do it, and instead I do a DFT, and, uh, uh, or they have to spend, my students sometimes have to spend eight months trying to figure out what a good active yeah, space is. And mm -hmm. instead, if you can just uh, have some suggestion from this automated procedure, maybe the method will become my, more user friendly. So we think yeah, that it's not really a way to replace uh, the hard work and the humans, but to, to help them in the first phase. Okay, interesting. Nice. Thank you, Laura. Thank you very much. Do you have time for another question, Laura? Sure. Okay. <laughs> So, Daniel. Okay. Hi, Laura. Hi. Very interesting talk. Thank you. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, you told that uh, right now we have analytical gradients for MCPDFT and the, for its variants. Uh, could you use it to find the crossing points? Uh, I mean, uh, point of intersection and the single triplet inter-existing crossing. I think Sebastian asked something related to the dynamic, for dynamics. And the, the another question is, uh, in your experience, uh, how far is uh, this op optimizer geometry is in relation to that op optimizer with SPT2 method? So for the first part, uh, so we are now uh, developing gradients with this uh, state interaction. So the idea would be that we can really optimize structures at a conical intersection. So it's coming. At the moment, we have just gradients for state specific and state average. So suppose that it's equivalent of doing a, a, um, a gradients for CAS PT2, but not yet a gradients for MS CAS PT2. Okay, we are we are developing them, but they should come. It's just a matter of uh, we have the theory. It's just a matter of uh, programming it and make sure that it gives good results. Concerning the the geometries, I, I have to be honest. We have tested the geometries much less than we have tested the energies. Uh, so, but. Uh, uh, for the, the systems that we've studied so far, I would say that the um, MCPDFT geometries are um, in between CAS SCF and CAS PT2 geometries. Probably a little, so they are a little closer to CAS PT2 than CAS SCF, but they are in between. But what is beautiful is that, uh, you know, for CAS PT2, you need to huge, huge basis sets uh, to get uh, good results. While with um, um, MCPDFT is more a CAS SCF kind of method, so uh, you don't need to use it to go to very extended basis set to get. Uh, so if you use a triple zeta basis set, I would say that uh, it's, it gives you reasonable results already. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Any other okay. question? No? So, I thank you again, Laura, for this Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much. It was very nice. Thank you, everybody. And I hope these students write to you because in Brazil, we are not uh, in a good situation for fellowships and maybe that can go abroad yeah. and have yeah, a very please nice contact me. And Sebastian, time. write to me, okay? Sebastian? Okay. I already sent you an email. Oh, okay, I hope right. it okay, I didn't check my email. Sorry. Okay. All right. <laughs> bye bye. See you, everybody. Thank you very much. Bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Goodbye, everybody. Bye, Sebastian. Bye bye. bye, -bye.